Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jan Sixtens, and um, I'm the acting rector of uh, the Riga Graduate School of Law. Um, I guess uh, um, life is out about uh, privileges. Um, I, I truly believe that privileges is what makes life really, really uh, interesting and, and uh, rich in colors. Uh, so one of the privileges is to start this event right on time, uh, although we are at an academic institution. The other privilege, which is much, much greater than that, is that we have um, uh, a very uh, experienced speaker uh, today, and that is uh, Valdis Dombrovskis. Um, he is uh, vice, uh, um, what's the uh, vice president of the European Commission, uh, who is in charge of Euro and social dialogue. Um, he uh, has a very rich uh, political experience. Uh, he has served as Minister of Finance of Latvia, and he has served also as the Prime Minister. Um, of Latvia. He is uh, one of the uh, uh, key persons that uh, some 10 years ago um, architected uh, Latvia's uh, exit from uh, the economic crisis that we uh, had at that time. And um, he has uh, also essentially uh, uh, presided over Latvia's accession to the uh, Eurozone. Uh, by the way, we're celebrating uh, five years of Euro in Latvia this year, and uh, we also uh, celebrate 15 years of the largest uh, EU expansion in its history. So um, I don't think I will be able to name all the positions and, and functions that uh, uh, Mr. Dobrovskis has uh, uh, fulfilled in his uh, professional career. So, uh, uh, Vice President, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank uh, Riga Graduate School of Law for this uh, invitation and uh, possibility to present uh, the work we are doing on uh, deepening the economic and monetary union. Well, when we discuss uh, economic and mon uh, when uh, uh, when we discuss economic and monetary union, it must uh, be said that. Uh, it was a global financial and economical crisis which uh, triggered some reconsideration of how our economic monetary union or Eurozone is functioning and what needs to be done to strengthen the resilience of Euro area and uh, Euro. And uh, here we basically how uh, uh, this reflections basically have started already in 2000 and. Uh, 12 with uh, four presidents' reports and uh, commission's communication towards uh, deep and genuine economic and monetary union. Uh, here we have uh, documents which had been prepared and presented during this term of European Commission as of uh, uh, early 2015. Uh, and just recently we had a Sibiu summit this month where EU leaders, uh, uh, heads of state and government, were discussing uh, how uh, EU should develop in the future, and this, of course, includes how Eurozone should develop in the future. So there are some quotes back from 2015 related to this. So uh, if you look now at what have been the developments of economic and monetary union in uh, uh, recent uh, years. Here we basically see the uh, impact of global uh, financial and economical crisis and the subsequent uh, recovery. We see that the crisis hit uh, Europe hard and uh, 
uh, ever since we had to do many things to uh, recover. But one can say now Europe is in good economic times. We are in a seventh year of uninterrupted economic growth. Uh, investment has uh, uh, recovered. Uh, unemployment has also uh, uh, recovered to pre-crisis uh, levels. So, uh, to a large extent, uh, we had dealt with uh, with a, a crisis and aftermath of the crisis. And here are the overview of the measures which European Union has taken to strengthen the economic and monetary union uh, uh, since uh, the crisis. So, first, uh, European uh, um, semester, so fiscal and macroeconomic governance. So one of the lessons of the crisis was that um, we need to coordinate a closer economic and fiscal policies of member states, uh, because what happens in one country, especially if you talk about Eurozone, happens in uh, uh, affects other countries. And that was the purpose of European uh, semester, to have more proactive and uh, more close coordination of fiscal and macroeconomic uh, policies. Uh, second, uh, uh, it's uh, European uh, stability mechanism. It's to support Euro area countries in uh, difficulties. Once again, uh, we didn't have uh, mechanisms like this. So several ad hoc mechanisms had been created during the crisis, and by now we have this European stability uh, mechanism. Currently, no ca country is in program with European stability mechanism. Last country was Greece, which quit the program in August last year. ECB a monetary uh, policy. Uh, you may uh, uh, remember this uh, famous Mario Draghi's quote, to do whatever it takes uh, to preserve the euro. And whatever it takes was basically uh, referring to outright monetary transactions, meaning commitment of European Central Bank to purchase uh, member states' bonds in secondary market in unlimited quantity if necessary. And this was, was what helped to calm down financial uh, markets during the Eurozone uh, uh, crisis. And in between, uh, it has been also confirmed by European Court of Justice that outright monetary transactions are within the competence of uh, ECB. Uh, banking union, uh, capital markets union, I will go uh, in more detail when I will go uh, more specifically through those uh, uh, subjects. So let us start with the first uh, measure which has been uh, implemented, the European uh, semester. So what we are doing uh, in a context of European uh, semester, first we are setting EU's economic policy uh, priorities. And I would say that uh, uh, during the last years, uh, those uh, priorities have been centered around uh, 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 three uh, issues. So, to support investment, to facilitate structural reforms to strengthen the competitiveness of member states, and to ensure responsible fiscal uh, policies. Uh, then we had to recognize that uh, when we are dealing with uh, the crisis, its uh, causes are not always fiscal. So we also need to look at macroeconomic imbalances which are building up. So we have a whole scoreboard of uh, macroeconomic indicators which we are following and correspondingly uh, dealing with macroeconomic imbalances. Uh, in recognition that uh, Eurozone countries require stronger coordination, Eurozone countries how to submit their draft budgetary plans for a a scrutiny of European uh, Commission, which gives its assessment of compliance of Eurozone countries' uh, uh, budgets with the EU fiscal rules. Uh, so this is the first uh, uh, so to say stage of European semester, which uh, is uh, typically in autumn, in November. Uh, second stage is uh, uh, member states' reports, in-depth reviews, um, stability convergence programs, uh, uh, national reform programs. Uh, so what, are, what does it mean? So member state reports, basically European Commission prepares its assessment on economic situation and challenges in given member states. Uh, In-depth reviews concerns uh, countries which 
may be experiencing macroeconomic imbalances, so those countries are assessed in more detail. Uh, stability and convergence programs, it's basically medium-term fiscal frameworks of uh, member states. Stability programs for Eurozone countries, convergence programs for countries outside Eurozone, and uh, countries also submit their national reform programs, uh, uh, also uh, uh, linked with uh, country-specific recommendations issued by European Commission in previous years. And then uh, the conclusion of European semester is with a set of country-specific recommendations to each member state, so what member states need to do in fiscal area and in macroeconomic area. So now, how countries look in a context of macroeconomic imbalances uh, procedure. We see uh, a number of uh, countries, including Latvia, not experiencing macroeconomic imbalances, number of countries having macroeconomic imbalances, and countries mainly in the south having excessive macroeconomic imbalances. Sometimes the question may come uh, why, for example, Germany and Netherlands are uh, having macroeconomic imbalances, their economies are going uh, strong. Uh, the point is large uh, current account surpluses. So in a sense, in macroeconomic imbalances procedure, also current account surplus exceeding 6% of GDP is considered imbalance and thus uh, reflected also in recommendations to those countries. And here, uh, uh, as an example, it's a set of country-specific recommendations which Latvia received in uh, 2018, and next month uh, we will come with a next set of country-specific recommendations, and I would say it's uh, kind of typical as a structure of recommendations. First one is a fiscal, so what country should do in fiscal area with its budget. Uh, then it's uh, uh, lots of things, so concentrating in case of Latvia on social issues, on the need to reduce income inequality and uh, poverty, and uh, efficiency of uh, public administration. Overall, our assessment is that uh, during the last year, uh, Latvia has made limited progress in addressing country-specific recommendations, uh, which doesn't sound uh, great, but it must be said that most EU member states how somewhere between limited and some uh, progress. So it's uh, uh, could uh, uh, it means that uh, all in all uh, we need to improve the implementation of country specific recommendations. And uh, here is uh, so to say EU member states uh, where they stand to certain EU uh, fiscal uh, uh, framework. Uh, so um, uh, sorry. Uh, 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 countries uh, which are uh, uh, subject of fiscal compact or also Treaty on Stability uh, 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 Coordination and uh, uh, Governance. It all concerns uh, fiscal uh, policies. As you uh, see, of course, it primarily concerns all Eurozone countries where the surveillance is tighter and uh, uh, then there are two further groups of uh, countries. And three countries are basically outside of this uh, framework, uh, Czech Republic and UK, because they decided so when we were setting out this uh, uh, fiscal uh, post-crisis fiscal uh, framework, and uh, Croatia, because it joined later and uh, uh, didn't join also this uh, uh, framework. Nevertheless, the requirements of stability and growth pact concerns all EU member states. Then, uh, if we look at the uh, uh, situation of uh, uh, Eurozone, how Euro is uh, uh, perceived by uh, citizens, actually we see that uh, support for Euro is at uh, historic highs, so uh, around three quarters of people think that Euro is a good thing for Europe. Uh, it means that people are appreciating the benefits which uh, Euro is bringing to the uh, uh, EU economy and uh, everyday life, and as you see uh, in Latvia, support for Euro is actually above uh, EU average, which by the way was not the case when we had discussions about Latvia joining the Eurozone, when it required lots of effort actually to convince the population of uh, merits of joining the Euro area. Uh, and uh, also we see, uh, oh, this is 
bit uh, semi-Latvian, semi-English, okay? <laughs> uh, because I have those presentations in both languages and sometimes <laughs> you apparently get some fusion of them. Uh, 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 this is a bit of an interesting uh, phenomena. If you look at, uh, uh, sorry, if you look at the support for uh, uh, euro in general, uh, typically it's high. If you ask the same question, support for euro in your own country, typically it's somewhat lower. But still, as you see, it's a convincing majority of people in Latvia supporting euro also in uh, uh, Latvia. Okay, then uh, wh where do we go uh, from there? So what are the next steps in deepening economic and monetary union? Here are the main guiding uh, uh, principles of deepening the EMU. So first, deepening of EMU is not an end in itself. We don't need to deepen EMU to, for the sake of deepening it. So it's uh, about uh, facilitating economic growth, facilitating economic convergence among Eurozone countries and uh, financial uh, stability. Of course, it needs to be done in a transparent, democratic and accountable way. Uh, and uh, 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 this is a process which has to be open to all member states. In a sense, uh, we do not need to create new dividing lines between Eurozone and non Eurozone countries, and we do not need to undermine the integrity of EU internal market. So, the integrity of internal market has to be uh, preserved. And uh, this is an uh, issue among many things which revolves uh, how much, uh, uh, so to say, risk sharing we accept in economic and monetary union and uh, how much risk reduction we must ensure in member states to be able to move forward with risk uh, sharing. That's where uh, we have two very pronounced uh, schools of thought among EU member states. <laughs> uh, okay, now uh, on uh, next uh, steps. It's a bit like uh, things which had been done already and, and next steps. So uh, I was mentioning about um, uh, deepening of EMU. Uh, banking Union, one of the initiatives which has been introduced. Uh, it's worth remembering that uh, uh, crisis started as a financial crisis. So uh, uh, it was logical that uh, we needed to look at the financial sector, at the banking sector, uh, and uh, first to strengthen the regulation uh, to ensure that banks are better capitalized, has better liquidity uh, buffers, has lower uh, leverage ratios. Basically, that banks are more able to absorb economic shocks if they come, and uh, that we moved uh, from the principle of bailout, meaning that banks make mistakes and then taxpayers have to pay, uh, to the principle of bail-in, meaning that it's first banks uh, shareholders and creditors which are paying for uh, banking sector mistakes. So what has been done? Uh, single rule book, it means uh, string strengthening the regulation, uh, single supervisory mechanism uh, within uh, the European Central Bank, so sim single supervision of the banks, uh, and uh, uh, single resolution mechanism and single resolution uh, fund. So this is a way how to deal with problematic or failing banks. Clear rules how uh, uh, we are dealing with uh, failing uh, uh, banks. Uh, then uh, what uh, a couple of other things probably I'll not go in all detail. Uh, so what um, needs to be done? So uh, currently we reached an agreement to, for a backstop to the single resolution fund. It's a fund to uh, support bank resolution if it's needed, if the bank is uh, failing. Uh, the question is not answered yet what happens if uh, this fund runs out of money, so it needs a fiscal backstop. There's agreement on this fiscal backstop, but it still needs to be implemented. And one thing uh, where we have not made too much progress is European Deposit Insurance Scheme. Uh, currently, deposits up to 100,000 uh, uh, euros for citizens are guaranteed. So even if the bank fails, citizens can get their money back. Uh, but uh, the question is not answered what happens if also state is at problems at that uh, moment. 
and that's the rationale of uh, European deposit insurance scheme. But uh, it must be said progress has been slow on this uh, among EU co-legislators, both uh, European Council and uh, uh, European Parliament have made uh, little uh, progress. And uh, uh, on uh, reduction of non-performing loans, they are basically almost at pre-crisis levels by now. And there is some work ongoing on sovereign bond-backed securities as a way to break bank sovereign loop, but also we have not advanced too far on this one. Then uh, there is a discussion on uh, EU budgetary instrument to uh, strengthen the Eurozone. So, um, uh, uh, basically, uh, two main aims. Uh, to support uh, the reforms in member states, to strengthen the resilience of member states, and to improve Euro European level shock absorption mechanisms. And, correspondingly, European Commission came with two uh, proposals on reform support program to support structural reforms in member states and with European investment uh, stabilization uh, function to uh, help member states sustain the level of public investment during the crisis. Uh, how far we have advanced on this? Uh, I would say uh, work in uh, progress. Uh, uh, we should be coming with the main design elements of Euro area fiscal instrument next month. Uh, but views are relatively uh, diverging. There was an initiative of uh, President of France, uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron, on uh, uh, having uh, a Eurozone budget uh, of several per, uh, uh, percents of EU GNI. Uh, it has not gone uh, too far. Currently, uh, where, uh, what is the current state of play of discussions? We are more or less centering around this reform support program, meaning 25 billion euros for seven years, possibly less. And it will be merged instrument to support reforms and investment. That's uh, 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 how far we have been uh, uh, currently going in discussions in uh, Eurogroup. Uh, and as I said, probably next month we'll have more uh, clarity on those main design elements, but I would say, uh, 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 if we have discussions on Eurozone budget, currently the level of ambition is uh, substantially lower. And Capital Markets Union. So Capital Markets Union, the uh, main idea is to diversify funding sources of EU economy. Currently, EU economy is uh, financed a lot from um, bank lending. Uh, in US, uh, for example, they're using much more actively capital markets, meaning uh, uh, companies themselves issuing shares, issuing corporate bonds, and uh, re uh, raising finance in this way. So uh, this is what we want to develop also in Euro. Uh, so it means financing opportunities for companies and better investment possibilities for savers and investors. They don't need to lock their money off in low interest bank accounts, but can use, uh, 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 can use uh, capital markets uh, to uh, uh, reach uh, uh, higher interest on their savings. And uh, it must be said that uh, uh, on Capital Markets Union, we had been uh, relatively successful during this mandate. Out of 13 uh, Capital Markets Union proposals, 11 have been adopted, which I would say is uh, quite a good uh, progress. Sustainable finance, uh, another issue which is uh, uh, currently uh, high on our uh, agenda. So EU has uh, committed its uh, emission uh, reduction targets or so-called uh, Paris goals, uh, which means that EU will need lots of investment actually to deliver on those commitments. The estimate is uh, uh, at least 180 billion euros uh, a year till 2030 to reach uh, Paris, uh, Paris goals. And it's clearly uh, uh, beyond reach of uh, public uh, sector only. So we also need private finance to contribute to our uh, sustainability targets. And uh, correspondingly, we uh, came with an action plan on sustainable finance and three concrete legislative uh, proposals. 
and two of them on low carbon benchmarks and on uh, transparency requirements uh, have already been adopted and hopefully we'll be able to conclude also the work on taxonomy or classification system during this year. Now, uh, to move uh, to the second part of my presentation, I'll probably uh, go uh, quicker through this one, is on economic developments in uh, Latvia and a broader European and economic uh, context. So, uh, currently, European Commission's spring economic forecast, so economic growth of 3.1% in uh, Latvia, which is substantially above EU average. And uh, here you see its uh, comparison with EU and Eurozone averages. Already for a number of years, uh, growth substantially uh, exceeds EU average. It means that Latvia is also catching up in terms of GDP per capita. And uh, here is a picture to compare all three Baltic states. As you see, the tendencies of development are broadly uh, similar. And uh, as a result of this economic growth, uh, Latvia is also catching up gradually with EU average uh, uh, GDP per capita in uh, purchasing uh, parity standard. So if before joining the EU it was 43% of EU average, in 2017 it was already 67 and it continues to improve. Uh, as regards uh, fiscal uh, policy, uh, well, uh, Latvia is not making headlines in terms of uh, fiscal uh, policy in Europe. But it must be said that in recent years, the uh, uh, situation has... Uh, not necessarily improved, and uh, as a result, Latvia currently has bigger budget deficits than uh, uh, EU and uh, Euro area uh, average, and actually, uh, uh, as you see, more towards the highest, um, uh, highest side, despite the fact that the economy is actually growing quite strongly. And uh, uh, here you see these uh, uh, tendencies in, uh, uh, also in other uh, Baltic states. Uh, unfortunately, it must be said, during the last year, Latvia has a tendency to have the highest budget deficits, despite having those good uh, economic growth uh, uh, rates. Uh, unemployment, once again, huge spike during the crisis, and now uh, going down quite substantially. Labor costs, a uh, uh, very uh, hot issue in uh, uh, Latvia because I would say this large wage differences is also one of the main drivers of uh, emigration. At the same uh, uh, time, the wage growth needs to be backed by productivity growth, only then it's uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, uh, as you'll see, uh, wages are uh, uh, so to say, steadily growing, and uh, actually during the last year, years the growth is quite strong, but still uh, only around 30% uh, of EU average. Clearly, it needs to continue to increase. And one issue which requires uh, additional uh, attention, and something we are emphasizing a lot also in our country-specific recommendations, is income inequality, where unfortunately Latvia is among countries which has High, uh, one of the highest levels of income inequality in the EU, and that clearly needs to be addressed. It's not only social, but also economic uh, issue. Current account uh, balance, uh, uh, currently nothing to worry too much. If you compare situation, for example, during the previous boom years, 2006-2007, uh, when uh, 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 current account uh, deficit exceeded 20% of GDP, which was really kind of flashing in red. Uh, 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 currently, one can say that the economic growth now is much more uh, balanced and much more uh, sustainable than it used to be before the crisis. No wonder it ended up in a crisis. Foreign investment also uh, gradually uh, increasing and main factors for uh, uh, affecting economic growth uh, uh, in, in Latvia, as you see, basically factor number one, and increasingly entrepreneurs are saying labor availability and linked with this also the uh, level of 
skills and adequacy of skills uh, vis a vis labor market uh, uh, requirements, and as you see, of course, a number of other factors. I will stop here with a uh, presentation. Uh, uh, thank you very much, and I am open to your uh, questions and uh, comments. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as we uh, are uh, uh, live on the web, and I'm not sure if I'm there, uh, probably I'm now, uh, we need to use microphone to ask questions. And I saw the first question over here. Hello, uh, Natalia Tuchilovska, lecturer at Riga Graduate School of Law and Stockholm School of Economics in Riga. I have two questions about the capital markets union. The first one is securitization, uh, which is kind of the uh, one of the main focus of, uh, of uh, uh, current process is uh, named to be uh, one of the failures and one of the main uh, reasons for the for previous financial crisis. So the question is uh, why uh, you believe it's going to be working this time. And uh, the second question is about the capital markets union and taxation. Uh, namely, capital markets union is an opportunity to open the borders for the investments for the, for the investors. And after we see the failure of the financial transaction tax uh, among the main member states, how can we have any hope that it's going to be working from the taxation part of you? Because taxation is very important for the investment of the retail of any investor in the market. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so on uh, first uh, question on uh, securitization, indeed, as you see in uh, our capital markets union uh, list, uh, it's uh, there. This is one of the proposals which has been already agreed. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, securitization by now has uh, somewhat bad uh, PR, so to say. Uh, uh, because it's immediately uh, associated with the problems of uh, securitized uh, products in U.S. during the financial uh, crisis. But that's exactly uh, uh, the point why it's simple, transparent, and standardized. Uh, uh, meaning that uh, it has to have more or less a homogeneous set of assets, which is part of uh, securitization, there has to be transparency what is in that uh, uh, security and uh, it's uh, standardized so that uh, investors can be uh, better assured if the securitization fits the uh, uh, standard uh, that it's a uh, safe uh, securitization. Uh, then, uh, so, uh, and that's maybe uh, the opposite of what we had before the crisis, which, which was neither simple nor uh, transparent nor uh, standardized. It was something very opaque that somehow, you know, uh, uh, subprime mortgages became triple uh, A securities. Uh, that's also the question of how credit rating agencies were managing miracles like that, but they somehow were managing. Uh, so, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we have uh, 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 taken into account lessons from the crisis when coming with this uh, securitization proposal, but uh, it must be said that securitization wasn't really an issue, uh, a financial stability issue in Europe, also during the last crisis. It was indeed a financial stability issue in the uh, US, but okay. Uh, Secretization is there. Why we believe it's uh, uh, important? Uh, uh, we can uh, manage with this way uh, that banking sector is operating more similar uh, to the way how it's operating in US, uh, meaning that banks do not need to hold all, for example, mortgages on their balance sheets. They can securitize the mortgages and uh, sell them on, thus freeing the space for more lending to the real economy. That's how it uh, functions in uh, US, and uh, uh, it has uh, potential also in uh, Europe. Then on uh, uh, taxation. Well, on taxation, we need to see uh, uh, what is relevant in terms of uh, taxation on uh, many of those uh, initiatives. And uh, for... Uh, 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 many, many initiatives, maybe uh, the uh, uh, taxation is not so much of an uh, uh, issue, uh, 
uh, when we discuss initiatives, uh, uh, for example, like uh, 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 prospectus addressing completely different issues, reducing the cost of companies to go uh, to the public market, so reducing the cost and complexity of documents they need to prepare, or uh, promotion of the SME's uh, growth markets, basically the uh, similar uh, uh, idea. Uh, so not uh, all of this uh, requires uh, some uh, specific tax uh, treatment. Some things require specific ta tax treatment. I can mention, for example, pan-European uh, personal uh, uh, pensions uh, product, uh, where indeed uh, while putting forward this proposal, we also put forward a recommendation to the member states that they treat a pan-European personal pensions product in the same way in terms of taxation as they treat their similar comparable national uh, pensions uh, products, because then that's uh, the only way how to make this product uh, work. So you really need to look uh, proposal by proposal where those taxation aspects are uh, relevant and where they are probably less uh, relevant. More questions? Thanks, Mr. Dombrovskis. I have a question regarding the uh, chart that you showed that had the European debt. Mm -hmm. um, if you can show that. So please. now I'm wondering which one was it's in the back. No, early. back still. Um, but going back to, to no, the European no. debt question. Yeah. Um, you know, there has been rumors and talk about setting sort of a two-tier European Union, given Is this the fact one you meant that the, or what? No, the, the map that had the European, oh, the yeah. But that was not a map of not debt, this one? but map of growth. Uh, oh, and that was of macroeconomic imbalances. Yes, the macroeconomic imbalances. Okay, I see. Yeah. The European debt bomb, I mean, basically, you know, countries like Italy, Italy. Spain, yeah. Portugal, mm -hmm. Greece. Um, I mean, they still have huge uh, debt public debt, um, you know, and somebody in Germany did suggest that we should sort of set up a two-tier uh, Eurozone. What are your opinions? I mean, mm -hmm. how do we solve that? You know, mm -hmm. people in the North aren't going to be consistently happy paying for people in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, on uh, uh, this, uh, indeed, uh, during the Eurozone crisis, some uh, kind of ideas of uh, two-tier Eurozone had been uh, uh, discussed, but uh, they actually hadn't been uh, moving uh, anywhere. There was, uh, for example, from uh, European uh, Commission side, we were not supporting that kind of ideas and actually working uh, quite a bit to ensure that Greece stays within Eurozone uh, as regards uh, uh, public debt. Uh, public debt uh, indeed is an issue in those countries, and that's why when we discuss uh, 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 EU economic policy priorities, uh, responsible fiscal policy is uh, one of the priorities. It's uh, inevitable, and when we issue our country specific recommendations, uh, countries with high debt level uh, also receive uh, recommendations on continued uh, debt uh, reduction. If you look, for example, at uh, Greece, uh, Greece's budget uh, currently is in surplus. Uh, Greece is uh, meeting its 3.5% of GDP primary surplus target. Uh, and, uh, of course, it's uh, uh, clear that it is needed uh, uh, because for Greece to return to the, uh, uh, so to say, to the market financing, with a debt-to-GDP ratio around 180% of GDP. It's a very delicate exercise. There's very little room for maneuver. And uh, that's why also, for example, uh, the debt measures uh, which uh, uh, creditors had agreed vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Greece are linked with a continuous adherence of Greece with post-program fiscal targets. So it's a, uh, designed in a way that if Greece meets its fiscal targets, it gets a certain uh, uh, debt uh, relief uh, measures, not writing off the debt, but uh, uh, rather improved conditionality of uh, servicing the debt. Uh, thank you. 
Um, I, I have a question regarding multi-annual financial framework. I'm a representative of Georgia, and in the previous MFF, we used to um, uh, get financing in the framework of ENI, a European Neighborhood Instrument. And now, uh, as the uh, European Commission proposed, uh, there, is, there will be one huge instrument which will incorporate more than 10 instruments. And uh, I would like to know, will it mean less financing for my countries because there are some countries where, with uh, migration, um, problems and um, climate change and what what um, will we lose out uh, with the new instrument? Well, uh, that's uh, definitely uh, not uh, the intention. Indeed, uh, in the next uh, period, the Commission proposed more uh, integrated uh, instrument for external action uh, uh, with a basic idea uh, to allow more flexibility in using this budget for external action. Uh, uh, and it's clear, we are preparing uh, MFF for seven years. For example, when we were preparing current uh, MFF, which was 2013 and uh, uh, 2020, uh, we uh, uh, couldn't envisage neither Russia's aggression against Ukraine, nor a migration crisis, nor many other issues. Uh, and uh, uh, then, if we have uh, budget divided in many sub-programs, it's much more uh, uh, difficult to react on developments in our neighborhood, would it be eastern neighborhood or southern neighborhood. Uh, and that was one of the reasons uh, why uh, we opted for this more flexible approach, because we don't know what kind of crisis will be looming in the next uh, five years. But we do know that uh, we will have to react to this, and for this uh, uh, we need some uh, flexibility in the, in the budget. But uh, certainly uh, not that the idea would be divert you know, funds away from uh, 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 Eastern Partnership to Southern Partnership or other way around. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your um, presentation. It was very uh, fruitful. Uh, I would like to ask to, about the inflation, how the entering uh, uh, to the MU uh, will uh, change the currency, I mean inflation in the Latvia, because before you have your own currency and after the uh, changing the, to the euro, uh, how it affect uh, mm -hmm. to the currency and the GDP and uh, I mean the economic mm -hmm. growth. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, one of the uh, uh, questions which is often asked, how joining the Eurozone uh, affects uh, inflation. Uh, and uh, experience of uh, all countries which uh, have uh, recently and even not so recently uh, joined uh, uh, the Eurozone, uh, when Latvia was joining we were studying uh, experience of countries uh, before us, starting, say, with Slovakia, which joined in 2009, and now a couple of, uh, uh, not couple, actually, only one country has joined after us. <laughs> uh, but uh, I would say, by and large, this experience is uh, similar, that uh, joining Eurozone has uh, one off effect uh, on inflation somewhere on, on a range of uh, uh, 0 to uh, 0 C percent but in the longer term it's uh, being uh, offset because there are a number of benefits uh, uh, to the economy in terms of uh, lower uh, interest rates because currency exchange risk which theoretically is there disappears. Uh, uh, this means lower financing costs for the economy. Uh, 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 currency uh, um, uh, conversion costs go down. Uh, especially open, uh, uh, important for small open economies like uh, uh, Latvia. Uh, 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 it facilitates uh, uh, inwards investment because also for investors it's easier uh, to work with uh, euros and with many uh, different national uh, uh, currencies. So uh, all in all, the effects on the economy is uh, uh, positive. Uh, to uh, be uh, concrete, in 2014, when Latvia joined the Eurozone, inflation was below 1%. Uh, 
Uh, European Central Bank's uh, target is inflation close to but below 2%. So in a sense, uh, Latvia was even uh, uh, substantially below uh, ECB target. It probably had to do more with uh, uh, our place in uh, economic cycle uh, because uh, inflation was very low across uh, uh, Eurozone in that uh, uh, period. Uh, but this is one of the most, I would say, persistent uh, myths uh, about joining the Euro. If you will join Eurozone, prices will raise. This is uh, classics. Uh, probably it comes uh, from, uh, from the very beginning, uh, because indeed when Euro was created, uh, one could see effect like this. But since then, so to say, lessons had been learned. And now, when introducing the euro, uh, countries are paying uh, lots of attention to this <coughs> price um, convergence, that prices are converted strictly according to the official rate. Uh, in parallel, uh, say in Latvia, we were uh, launching an initiative which was called Fair Introduction of Euro, where businesses were committing basically not to uh, use joining the euro as an excuse to raise uh, 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 prices. There was uh, uh, price monitoring before, there was a uh, monitoring of proper dual display of the prices. So uh, all those um, uh, measures had been uh, uh, taken, uh, strictly uh, followed, uh, uh, so to say one can say by uh, now we know how to introduce euro without a spike in the uh, uh, inflation. Uh, not that uh, uh, everything, uh, you know, always uh, uh, works uh, perfectly in this uh, way. I can tell a bit of an anecdotal uh, story uh, about Estonia, which joined in 2011. So what happened in 2011? Uh, Gazprom raised gas prices, uh, which then affected, for example, heating tariffs. <coughs> So heating tariffs in Estonia went up in 2011, and of course Eurosceptics were saying, you know, we told you once we introduce Euro prices go up. What, look what happens with heating tariffs, but the reason was entirely different. It was gas from rising the prices, so the prices would raise with or without uh, Euro. So not everything which happens in a year after Euro has to do with uh, Euro. More questions? Thank you so much for your interesting presentation. I'm representative of the Kyrgyzstan. I would like to know uh, that in June, a new strategy for partnership between uh, European Union and Central Asia will be presented. And could you be so kind to tell us your opinion about this strategy and maybe what new goals do European Union has in Central Asian countries? Thank you. Well, uh, I would like to be pretend that I'm expert in all uh, policy areas and know everything which EU does, uh, but the point is that uh, 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 that uh, we are specialized within the uh, European uh, Commission. So I'm uh, mainly do, do, uh, dealing with the uh, uh, economic and uh, financial questions, European semester, uh, Eurozone reforms, social dialogue, uh, uh, financial sector. Uh, but I'm not so much involved in uh, uh, EU's uh, external action. We have a, uh, a, a high representative for external uh, action in the EU. We have neighborhood commissioner in the EU, uh, uh, which are dealing with all those uh, issues. So I'm afraid I'm not able to give you detailed now assessment on uh, uh, EU's uh, Central Asia uh, strategy. But if you would in invite, for example, Federica uh, Margrini or Johannes Hahn, they definitely would be able to uh, give more uh, detailed overview on this. Hello, uh, my name is Stella. I'm from Moldova. Um, well, looking at this slide, uh, we can see that Italy actually now is more or less, let's say, in danger. And I would like um, to ask your opinion um, regarding the fiscal policy. Um, it's, we know that it's a coordinated competence of the European Union, right? So it's, yeah. Um, do you think uh, if European Union would go deeper into the fiscal policy, you think it will solve, well, will try to solve problems like what, what we have right now in Italy? Because uh, as far as we know, you, um, I think you're the one who coordinates the European semester and you somehow issued the reports 
on the country and um, we, apparently there is some countries that don't really comply with these reports. Mm -hmm. And you think this is an effective tool or European Union should go deeper? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay, so first as regards um, uh, fiscal uh, policy. Indeed, if you look specifically at Italy, uh, Italy is a country which has uh, one of the highest uh, budget deficits in the EU and also uh, second highest debt to GDP ratio in the EU. Uh, and indeed, we had uh, complicated discussions with Italy uh, last uh, December because when the government uh, changed, the new government came with the idea that they want to increase budget deficit instead of decreasing. <coughs> and they thought this way they will be uh, doing fiscal stimulus. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, this plan uh, didn't really uh, materialize because they increased the budget deficit. Uh, as a result, they triggered financial instability. Uh, as a result, interest rates in Italy increased both for sovereign lending and for broader economy. Confidence indicators went down, affecting uh, investment. And as a result, economy in Italy slowed down and uh, 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 the uh, economic slowdown has been most pronounced in Italy among all 28 EU uh, uh, member states. So this strategy was not really working. So uh, it took us uh, uh, quite a bit of time and effort to convince Italy's government to correct this uh, uh, course. So eventually they uh, reduced budget deficit back, but the damage to the economy was already uh, uh, done. And as, as a result, now they are expected to have bigger budget deficit, again, because growth is much slower than what we were so to say, uh, forecasting still at the end of the last uh, uh, year. But uh, from that point of view, one can say that the European uh, semester is working, that uh, it uh, makes uh, countries to reconsider their fiscal policy uh, uh, decisions. Uh, and uh, it, uh, increasingly, European semester is part of, you know, also domestic, uh, domestic policy debate on uh, fiscal uh, uh, policy. Uh, to give also a bit uh, anecdotal uh, comparison, uh, okay, so uh, uh, Italy, uh, um, when the new government uh, came, decided to increase uh, budget deficit to 2.4% of GDP. Uh, I was looking uh, at, and uh, you know, uh, uh, then everyone was concerned, the whole world was concerned, how come they want to increase budget deficit to 2.4%. Uh, I was looking at Italy's budget deficits before the crisis, and in 10 years before the crisis, only one year, budget deficit was below 2.4% of GDP, and nobody was worried. So it means that also the fiscal framework now is, is quite uh, different. It's not only uh, correcting, you know, gross policy uh, mistakes, but having much more preventive approach. And the very fact that before the crisis, nobody was uh, worried about uh, higher budget deficits in Italy. And now it's very much a debate whether 2.4% is appropriate, uh, shows that also the way uh, uh, semester is working has uh, changed also the Discuss, the way we discuss fiscal policy in Europe. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Rick. I study law and diplomacy here. I'm also active in the European Party Volt. Uh, you mentioned uh, that um, uh, social and income inequality in Latvia is uh, triggering also uh, migration. And I think uh, most people know that, uh, that Latvia has an issue with young people leaving Latvia to work somewhere else, and this money sometimes comes back to Latvia, sometimes doesn't. And my question too is, um, how do you think that the deepening of the union uh, will specifically address this issue for Latvia? And second question is, uh, what um, tools do you think Latvia has as a country to combat this uh, kind of uh, depletion, this drain of young people uh, leaving Latvia? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, if you look at the fundamental uh, reasons of uh, emigration, fundamental reasons are the still large wage differences between Latvia and, so to say, uh, Western European uh, countries. And that's 
that's the main uh, driving uh, factor. So uh, the main way how to address it, therefore, is wage growth. Uh, and uh, in Lithuania, one can say that last year actually was a year when those migration uh, 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 migration uh, flows had been turning. In a sense, more people started to return than leave. Uh, one can expect maybe Latvia being a year uh, behind or so. So now with uh, rapid economic growth, with rapid wage growth, I think we can uh, uh, change uh, this uh, uh, tendency. Uh, and, uh, of course, it has to be uh, coupled also with uh, inclusive policies, uh, reduction of income inequality, uh, because one thing is, uh, uh, so to say, average wage developments, which uh, currently are exceeding uh, 1,000 uh, euros, but another is still that uh, there are still many people earning uh, minimum wage, which is uh, uh, only 430 euros. And uh, then, uh, with wages like this, certainly you have lots of motivation to look uh, look uh, 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 elsewhere. So, that, uh, and uh, how uh, this whole uh, deepening of EMU agenda uh, affects uh, uh, those developments, I think, uh, uh, you cannot link everything with uh, 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 everything, and not everything what we do in terms of deepening of e EMU is immediately uh, relevant to uh, to the convergence of uh, uh, incomes. Uh, but uh, if it in general facilitates economic growth and stability in Eurozone, by extension it also facilitates uh, economic growth in Latvia and uh, uh, convergence in Latvia. Graduate School of Law. You ended up with your presentation with a quite a long list of the problems slowing down the long-term investment in Latvia. Uh, in keeping in mind your previous experience in Latvia and your knowledge and uh, position now, is there any good things already we are doing right for bringing long-term investment in Latvia? Well, uh, first of all, uh, if there are issues, <laughs> Uh, it uh, uh, doesn't uh, mean uh, that uh, we are not doing many uh, things uh, right. And uh, by and large, if you see those uh, uh, investment flows uh, in uh, investment uh, uh, flows in Latvia are uh, positive. Uh, we have a favorable uh, business environment uh, in, uh, for example, like World Bank doing uh, business uh, index Latvia's more among top countries than uh, uh, bottom countries. Uh, 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 there are uh, competitive advantages in, uh, 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 in terms of uh, uh, skilled uh, labor force, even though shortage is one of the issues which we are uh, uh, facing. Uh, so all in all, I would say the business environment and uh, investment environment in Latvia is uh, positive. But of course, we need to look what further needs to be done. And this is a, a list of challenges identified by uh, Foreign Investments Council uh, in uh, Latvia, and I think it can uh, also provide some guidance to the government when looking at issues which needs to be addressed. That this is a list of issues we need to continue uh, uh, to deal with. But uh, I would still argue that the starting positions, as the positions we are uh, uh, currently uh, in, are already uh, quite favorable for investment. More questions? When you were answering my previous question, I had uh, one more question popping up uh, uh, about the um, rating agencies. Basically, you told that uh, uh, previous secu securitization was not uh, so successful. There were rating agencies which were giving AAA, even though there was no AAA. So now we still have the same rating agencies there. So is there any point of uh, CMU to introduce the European rating agency? Because now we, are, we believe what the US uh, rating agencies are saying us. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, uh, first of all, the way uh, how rating agencies are doing uh, ratings and uh, how it's also uh, uh, scrutinized, uh, I would argue, also has changed uh, since uh, uh, global uh, financial and economical crisis. Uh, uh, indeed, there has been this talk about European rating agency. Uh, uh, to my uh, knowledge, it has not advanced uh, uh, too far, but first and foremost, it should be market-led uh, uh, initiative, in a sense, as uh, European institutions uh, will not be creating uh, 
rating agencies. It's, it's, it's clear it has to be a market-led uh, uh, initiative. We can look into reasons why, uh, so to say, also our ratings are being assessed by large U.S. Uh, uh, rating agencies. Uh, but uh, uh, the short answer uh, is that, yes, indeed, there were uh, discussions, but uh, uh, I'm not aware that there are currently some practical steps actually being made towards European Credit Rating Agency. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you spoke about the uh, Economic and Monetary Union in a pretty favorable terms. Um, on the other hand, the party that you represent uh, has not been particularly... Uh, Euro optimistic, and I wonder to what extent do you take into account what your party's position is on on certain issues? How do you reconcile that, or or maybe you are about to be expelled from your party? Well, uh, uh, this uh, question really uh, uh, surprises me. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, to, to my best uh, knowledge and what I know, what I know uh, from uh, uh, New Unity's position on European issues, uh, New Unity is uh, a pro-European party. And I remember when, uh, for example, Latvia was introducing the Euro, uh, it was, well, at that time it was Unity. Uh, uh, it was a unity really advancing and pushing this uh, process, and it was our party which was working quite a bit to uh, convince other parties uh, to uh, be on uh, board, uh, so it took uh, a bit of an effort to uh, convince, for example, National Alliance to be on board uh, for Euro introduction in Latvia, uh, some uh, other parties were against, for example, Greens and Farmers, they were for a year or so in opposition and suddenly they were against Euro introduction in Latvia. But uh, the first time I hear, you know, I have heard, uh, heard many things about our party, <laughs> uh, but uh, first time I, I'm hearing that uh, our party is not a pro-European uh, party, I would say rest assured. I didn't assured. say it's, um, a, it's not a pro-European, but I... I I don't think, uh, and this is what I've been hearing during this campaign, that the new unity is sort of, it is certainly in favor of, of the uh, European Union and, and Latvia's membership, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't favor, you know, much, much closer uh, uh, EU integration and giving more powers to Brussels. But if, you know, we probably, you, you, can, you can dispute that. But the question is also about your interaction with your political party on a daily, weekly, monthly, mm -hmm. whatever basis, and how that exchange of ideas and positions work in your mm -hmm. position. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, first uh, on, um, uh, on uh, where uh, Nuity stands in Europe, I think it's uh, quite uh, clear also in our uh, pre-election uh, manifesto for European elections, where we clearly say that we, uh, we are for a strong, united Europe, which is capable to act. Uh, we are outlining uh, quite a bit of issues on uh, 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 where Europe should be doing uh, more uh, together, for example, in the area of common foreign and uh, security policy, in uh, uh, dealing with uh, hybrid threats, with uh, uh, fake news. Uh, we outline uh, quite a bit uh, our views on next multi-annual financial framework, uh, by the way, supporting uh, the uh, uh, idea of enlarging the size of EU budget, uh, of course having specific uh, ideas uh, how this budget uh, should be uh, uh, spent. So uh, 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 what your question was probably uh, aiming at, uh, uh, indeed we are not Euro-Federalists and as part of European People's Party, uh, uh, European People's Party is also not a federalist group, so uh, uh, from that point of view, yes, we may uh, differ, for example, from ALDE group or uh, Development 4, but we are firmly pro-European uh, party. Uh, how uh, my interaction with the parties, I would say, uh, contributed quite heavily towards uh, party pre-election manifesto based on which we are currently running in European Parliament uh, uh, elections. So this relation is very close. More questions? Uh, 
Um, I have a question regarding um, austerity measures that your government undertook uh, in order to take your country out of the severe economic crisis. Usually it's not a popular uh, step, but uh, your people supported you and uh, you were re-elected uh, um, afterwards. Uh, and um, I would like to, I wonder what, what is your, the unique, uh, what's unique about your country and how did you manage to maintain support of uh, the citizens? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first of all, uh, indeed, uh, when I uh, took uh, office in uh, Latvia as a prime minister, it was uh, uh, March uh, 2009, uh, and it was in the middle of a uh, deep uh, financial and economical uh, crisis. Latvia was already in double digits uh, uh, recession. Uh, Latvia was already in IMF uh, program, and that was basically uh, the reason why uh, previous government uh, collapsed, because they were not able or willing to deal with those uh, uh, crisis uh, uh, measures. And that's where uh, uh, myself and uh, our party came uh, uh, in. So what was uh, uh, helping, I would say, um, uh, two reasons. First, we were not blamed for uh, creating the crisis uh, before uh, uh, before the crisis during the uh, boom uh, uh, years uh, uh, we were in opposition and actually uh, quite outspoken of Latvia developing severe economic imbalances and uh, urging government to address them not that they were uh, listening uh, there was a uh, uh, kind of uh, motto of uh, government at that time, pedal to metal, <laughs> that's it, full speed forward. Uh, unfortunately, it ended uh, very uh, miserably, but that was the first thing. So we were not really blamed for having uh, uh, created the crisis. We were seen as the ones which came actually to, to sort out uh, uh, this uh, difficult situation where Latvia was in. Uh, second, uh, that uh, with a, a adjustment program, which we uh, did, we had a front-loaded uh, adjustment program, both in terms of fiscal consolidation and in terms of structural reforms. And this helped to turn around the uh, economy also quite uh, uh, rapidly, uh, because financial stability is precondition for economic growth. So by ensuring financial stability, we were able to return to the economic growth. So by the second half of 2010, Latvia was already having year-on-year -year growth. So by the time of elections in 2010, uh, what was it now, October 2010, uh, we had first results we could actually uh, demonstrate. Uh, in parallel, uh, we were dealing with the uh, social consequences of the crisis, so uh, besides all the measures we were taking, we were uh, additionally creating additional social safety network uh, to deal with the social consequences of the crisis, so to uh, uh, show that uh, we uh, 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 also uh, care about most vulnerable people in a society during this uh, economic, uh, uh, economically difficult uh, period. And uh, fourth, I would mention that we had a functioning uh, social dialogue. That, you know, we're not seeking solutions on streets, but sitting at the negotiating table, we created what was called a reform management group together with social partners, with other organizations, and seeking solutions there. Not that we are always agreeing and not that they were not criticizing the government, but uh, nevertheless, uh, I think this also helped to uh, improve the level of acceptance of the uh, strategy dealing with the crisis. I would say it's a combination of all those factors which actually uh, uh, helped uh, uh, to have acceptance of the uh, population that, yes, we are in a crisis, but we need to act to come out of the crisis. Hello, once again, with a question, sorry. Uh, we are here, a group of 32 people, actually, and I probably would speak on behalf of my colleagues. We um, are in the process of still learning about the European institutions. And the other day we were discussing with our professor that um, there is some, um, a little bit a different, uh, well, 
not that different, an, an innovative way of working now in the European or in the Juncker's um, Commission. So you are now like not divided, but gathered in clusters. And even, for instance, our um, uh, European Union delegations, for instance, now in my country, they work the same as the European Commission. They do have clusters. So the question would be, how do you assess this way of working? A little mm -hmm. bit out of the economic yeah, issues. Okay. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, indeed, uh, this word clusters was uh, mentioned somewhere in a document when uh, this uh, commission has been uh, set up. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, what we are having, it's not uh, necessarily a uh, cluster. So it's uh, uh, how it's uh, functioning is that it's a bit more uh, flexible, that uh, there are vice presidents overseeing certain policy areas, broad policy areas, and setting up project teams to coordinate those uh, policy areas. But it may well be that uh, those uh, project teams are overlapping in terms of uh, composition. So we do not have strictly clusters. Those commissioners are in this cluster. Those commissioners are in that cluster. But there, are, there is a set of different project teams dealing with uh, different issues, and they may be uh, uh, overlapping. <coughs> but OK, the main idea was uh, uh, still the same. Uh, to overcome this uh, silo mentality in the European Commission that uh, uh, each uh, Directorate General is uh, acting as a uh, fortress <laughs> on its uh, own and uh, there is uh, a little interaction and which then uh, leads to the problems in later uh, stages of decision making. So with this uh, coordinating role of Vice Presidents and this structure of project teams, uh, one can identify uh, potential conflicts, uh, differences of view much earlier and also to address it much earlier and to arrive at more coherent result at the end of the uh, day. Uh, so uh, by and large, I think it's, it's functioning well. Well, not that I can compare because I was not in a commission in previous terms when there was no structure like this. Yeah, uh, but uh, 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 but my perception is that overall it's functioning well. Uh, more questions? Hello, my name is Jamshed. I'm from Tajikistan. Thank you for your presentation. So my question is about if the Brexit project happens, to what extent it, gonna, it is going to negatively impact on fiscal and monetary policy of EU at all? Mm -hmm. Okay, on uh, uh, Brexit. Uh, what are economic consequences of Brexit? Actually, uh, uh, there has been uh, um, some, you know, uh, general estimates, uh, but not too uh, detailed uh, calculations because A, we don't know when Brexit will happen, B, we don't know how Brexit will look like. So, you know, uh, you are a bit uh, in uh, hypothetical uh, uh, territory here. Uh, I can uh, mention, for example, more recent IMF study, uh, which was made with the assumption of uh, uh, having Brexit on uh, uh, 29th of March this year, which was the original Brexit date. And uh, their assumption was that even uh, in a scenario of no deal Brexit, EU's economy would uh, continue to grow. There is a negative effect, but it's not, uh, not uh, a very strong effect. Of course, it's uh, uh, regionally uh, quite unevenly dis uh, uh, distributed. There are uh, countries which are uh, heavily affected, first and foremost, for example, Ireland. <coughs> but uh, all in all, on the EU economy, yes, it's negative uh, economic effect, but it's, uh, it's within manageable. Uh, what we see is that it has more pronounced negative economic effect on UK itself. Uh, estimates uh, vary, but uh, up to some uh, two and a half percentage points of uh, uh, GDP negative effect of uh, Brexit. Uh, but um, 
now what uh, uh, what can we say, say? First, we need to see uh, if and when uh, Brexit uh, happens, because uh, I think the whole Brexit process shows that uh, there is a uh, lots of under appreciation of the role of the EU in everyday lives. And uh, now uh, when uh, uh, there was this Brexit campaign, Brexiteers were promising all kinds of things. Uh, and uh, uh, when after the referendum you actually needed to start negotiating, it turned out that things are actually much more complex and much more uh, complicated. And that's why these Brexit uh, negotiations had been so uh, difficult because we are, uh, uh, so to say, closely integrated and this uh, disentangling uh, 40 uh, 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 years or so of uh, um, uh, uh, economical and regulatory integration, it uh, turns out it's not so uh, easy. And now what is happening, this uh, fantasy Brexit is not happening, it's just not there, and UK has difficulties to choose uh, among real options. So uh, you remember there were votes in British uh, Parliament, do you want a deal, which British government has negotiated, no, uh, do you want no deal, no, do you want customs union, no, uh, do you want Norway model, no. Uh, uh, so uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's for UK to decide so what model out of the realistic models they really uh, prefer. And that uh, apparently takes more time. That's why UK has asked already for a second extension. So we must see how it will go further. But it's for UK to make up its mind. Well, uh, Sardar Manan from Uzbekistan. And actually, uh, uh, it was mentioned uh, that the Latvia is celebrating five years of Euro. And my question uh, is connected to the international role of euros. And uh, as we know that the dollar is widely spread uh, currency now, and what do you think that the euro in the future that could replace the role of dollar mm -hmm. in the upcoming future? Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, uh, indeed, as regards uh, international role of the uh, euro, uh, European Commission has came uh, forward with this initiative last uh, December. Uh, Euro is already world uh, second largest uh, uh, currency and uh, so we are looking now at the ways how we can further uh, increase the use of Euro internationally. So uh, we look at different uh, policy areas. Uh, uh, what needs to be done to strengthen euro as reserve currency, what needs to be done to have more use of euros in payments, uh, in uh, international trade. Uh, and we are now looking, so to say, sector by sector and coming with more uh, specific uh, uh, initiatives. Well, at the end of the day, it's uh, uh, clear that it's market decisions which, currently, which currencies market participants are using. So what we need to work on is to improve the, uh, uh, improve the use uh, uh, or attractiveness of the euro. Uh, and by doing so, uh, we believe that uh, more multipolarity, if you want, in a currency so is going to be beneficial for the uh, world economy. It's also going to be beneficial for EU itself because it reduces uh, uh, a number of ris risks, including currency exchange risk uh, for EU uh, companies. And it also uh, limits uh, the uh, effects of uh, U.S. having this tendency towards uh, weaponizing the dollar or dollar uh, transactions. Any more? Okay, if there is no more questions, uh, then I have uh, one question still left, which would sort of, sort of summarize uh, perhaps this discussion. And... Uh, uh, you're known in Latvia as someone who has taken the country out of the economic crisis, and uh, we can see also that from at least from from this chart. But um, what do you think you will be remembered for as the vice uh, president of the European <coughs> Commission? Uh, well, you know that's uh, that's a, a difficult uh, question. You know. Uh, 
I was not intending to uh, draw kind of uh, legacy on this uh, term of uh, European uh, Commission, so probably I will rephrase it slightly proper what had been the main issues that had been dealing with, and then it's for others to decide what to remember and what to forget. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, probably the main issues I would uh, emphasize is uh, uh, Eurozone reforms, deepening the economic and monetary union, what my lecture was uh, about. Uh, uh, many things have been done in this uh, area. Uh, I would uh, mention dealing with the Greek crisis, ensuring that Greece stays within uh, uh, Eurozone. Uh, uh, similarly, I would mention macrofinancial assistance programs to Ukraine because I was uh, very committed to this, uh, 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 considering that it's important to support Ukraine in a difficult situation where they are facing uh, Russia's aggression. Uh, I would uh, uh, mention the work on the uh, banking union and even more so on the capital markets union because we made major advances uh, uh, there. So as you see, there had been a number of things which had been done uh, during this uh, uh, mandate, but then it's for others to decide <laughs> what to remember out of this. <laughs> okay, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, His Excellency for this uh, very uh, interesting and useful uh, discussion of uh, EU matters, and uh, I hope uh, to see you back at, uh, at RGSL in whatever capacity you have after the elections. Thank I'm you. Looking forward.